Okay, the goal of this video is to walk you through a few basic exploratory data analysis commands in R. Uh, there are three R scripts that you'll need, titanic.r, citytemps.r, and mammalsleep.r. Uh, these are all available on the class website under the scripts tab, so I assume that you have downloaded those. You'll also need the corresponding data files, uh, so that would be titanicsurvival.csv. Uh, the mammalsleep one is actually stored in a library, uh, and the, uh, the other one that we'll need, if we go back to our studio, uh, is the city temps. Those two data sets you should have already had, and those are C-A-S-A-N-D-I-E.txt for San Diego, uh, and S-D-R-A-P-C-I-T-Y.txt, temperatures in Rapid City. Okay, so I assume you've downloaded those and uh, have them in a particular directory on your hard drive. Uh, let's go back to the scripts here. All right, so uh, we'll start by loading in these libraries. Highlight that, hit Command Enter, uh, or on a Mac, or Control Enter on a PC, uh, and we should load those libraries down here in the console window. All right, now, depending on which version of the effects library you've had, this Titanic survival data set may be in there already, uh, but in case it's not, let's go ahead and walk through importing it uh, from the CSV file that I have on the website. We'll click Import Data Set from Text File, drag this over here so you can see it, and now you just have to surf uh, to wherever it is uh, on your hard drive that you've downloaded these files. Uh, my particular one is in this directory right here. Here's titanicsurvival.csv. I click open. It detects the data format, and you notice that here's now the data frame. Uh, name, survive, sex, and age, uh, and passenger class. Everything looks right here, so I click import, and now Titanic Survival uh, is available to manipulate. Okay. Um, as we recall, this simple command here, uh, simply passing a data set to the function names, uh, just says, what are the variables called in this data set? And there they are. Uh, the first one is just x. Uh, that was a missing name. Uh, that column didn't have a name in the original data set, but the others have names, and here they are. Um, we remember that you can just dump the whole data set to the output screen if you want by highlighting this, hitting Command-Enter, and now everything just appears down here in a console. That's usually not too useful. Well, often, if you just want to take a look, quick look at the structure of a data set, use the head or tail, which show the first few lines or the last few lines, respectively. So if we hit that, now we see the first six lines, and here they are. Uh, every row here is a case. Every column, of course, is a variable. All right, let's use a couple of different commands here to make tables. Uh, we have some categorical information about each person. Uh, let's focus on these two variables here, uh, whether someone survived the Titanic sinking uh, and what sex they were. So if we want to do uh, cross-tabulate the people by those two uh, attributes there, we use the xtabs command, stands for cross-tabulate. The syntax here, remember this little twiddle sign means modeled by or stratified by. And then here we want to stratify the data set by two things, survived and sex. Those are variables that are names in the data set called Titanic Survival. So if we source that whole line right there, we get our table. Uh, and the tally function, uh, which is available in the Mosaic library, so uh, in order for this to work, you must have loaded that library up here, does exactly the same thing that xtabs does, except you'll notice that it also gives you the column totals down here, the row totals over here, and then the total number of cases there. And once you've got this basic syntax, you can start tallying things for other variables as well. So we can look at a, a contingency table for who survived stratified by passenger class, uh, and then even for a cross or an interaction between sex and passenger class. Uh, this is most easily understood by its behavior rather than just my explaining it. And you notice that what R does is construct a separate column in this contingency table for every combination of the factors. Uh, first class passengers, female, second class passengers, female, etc. Uh, and that colon does that for you. Okay. Now, if let's say, uh, for example, that you wanted to take a quantitative variable, in this case age, uh, and turn it into a categorical predictor. Uh, so you, for example, wanted to understand uh, how whether being an adult 18 and above or a child 17 or below uh, influence your survival. The way we do that, uh, namely by taking a quantitative predictor and turning it into a categorical predictor, is with the cut function. So here, Titanic survival dollar age, that's saying pick out the age variable in the Titanic survival data set, uh, cut that into intervals. Uh, and here we'll specify what the endpoints of the intervals are. Uh, so here they are 0, 17, and infinity. Uh, there's no maximum age, although in practice there is a maximum age in this data set. 
Uh, you'll notice what happens if we source this line here. We are going to store the result of that computation in the age factor variable. That's just what we've decided to call it. Oops, I accidentally deleted it there, but uh, here it is restored again. Okay, uh, we hit command enter on that one. You notice nothing happens here in the console window, but if I, if I now type in age factor and hit enter, here are all of the cases uh, for which we've got that information. You notice there are a lot of NAs here. NA stands for not applicable, and it's telling you that we don't have, we, we didn't have the available information to figure out which bucket this particular person fell into. Uh, in other words, we had missing information about their uh, about their uh, their age. Now you'll notice that the labels of these uh, of these buckets aren't very informative. They're just labeled in terms of the interval here, uh, you know, zero to seventeen, seventeen to infinity. Uh, we want to give them more informative labels, and so we'll redo this, uh, in other words, overwrite the result of the previous computation by adding a flag to the cut function. We add a comma after the breaks, and then we specify a new flag, in this case labels, and we say we want these labels to be the vector child and adult. So we highlight that, we hit command enter, and now if I look at age, sex, factor, or I'm sorry, age factor, we've got now the labels are adult and child. Uh, and we can do the same thing with that, uh, th this idea of a cross or an interaction. Now age factor uh, and sex are two variables here. Uh, we can cross them and define a new categorical variable or a factor. And I'll, st I'll, I'll do that with this factor command right here and store the result in age sex factor. Okay, and you'll notice now if I go down here and type age sex factor, uh, that's a variable with the, the relevant label. Here's an adult male, uh, here's a child male, etc. Okay, so let's now use that factor that we created to make a table. Let me move this over a little bit so we don't have line breaks. Uh, so here's that X tabs command that we're familiar with. Uh, we're going to stratify the data set by survival status and by this new factor that we've created using the commands up here. And I'm going to store the result in a variable called tab1. Tab1 doesn't get outputted here. In fact, that gets written to that variable right there. But now if I type tab1, you'll notice that I've got the table and it's much the same as we had before. Okay, so that goes over a few basic commands in R, uh, cross-tabulating things, defining new factors, creating factors or categorical variables from quantitative predictors uh, using the cut function. Next, let's go to the citytemps.r script. Uh, what we've got in here, uh, or what we're intending to analyze in this file, is data on the daily temperatures, the average daily temperatures uh, in two cities, San Diego, California, and Rapid City, South Dakota. Okay, so first things first, we need to import the data set. We'll do that from a text file because I've stored those, drag this over here, uh, I've stored those uh, on my hard drive in this directory. Uh, your directory obviously will be different. So surf to wherever you've got the, uh, the, these data sets stored. Here's mine, C-A-S-A-N-D-I-E, that's San Diego. I click open, and you're going to notice immediately that we're getting an error here. Okay, uh, The reason we're getting an error is because R thinks that it's tabs that are separating the cells uh, of this table. Uh, it's actually just white space. And you notice once we change the separator to white space rather than tab, we get a correct import down here and everything is good. So just uh, you know, be warned that sometimes R won't be smart. Uh, you know, it's generally pretty smart, but sometimes it makes mistakes at understanding things like what is separating the values in your data set. Click import. And now C-A-S-A-N-D-I-E is a data set available to plot, manipulate, etc. Let's quickly do the same thing with the Rapid City data. Import data from text file. Uh, again, surf to wherever you've got this thing stored. And it's sdrapcity.txt. So we'll open that. Again, we're getting that same error. Change the separator to white space, and you're good to go. Okay, we can close these particular things right there and go back to the citytemps.r script. So the most basic thing we might want to do uh, is make a histogram of temperatures, get a sense of how things uh, just look. So we do that. There's a lot of different commands to do that in R. The most basic one is hist. We'll, uh, we'll use hist and histogram, depending on context. So uh, you know, here we go. Let's just plot the temperatures uh, in the C-A-S-A-N-D-I-E file and make a histogram of them, uh, and there they are. You'll notice it pops up over here in the plot window. 
Uh, and if you want to move this out of the plot window, you can just click zoom uh, and you'll get uh, a much bigger one that you can save uh, and uh, resize and, and that sort of thing. Okay, let's close that. All right, now let's, uh, the other thing you might wanna do is, is change the default title here. This isn't uh, super useful. So let's change the title of that histogram to something more informative. The way we do that is by adding a flag called main to the hist function. In this case, this is saying we want the main title to be, well, this thing. And now here it is over here. I, it's actually over uh, run this window, but if we zoom here, you've got the histogram with your title. Okay, let's close that. All right, let's do the same thing for Rapid City. Line 20 here uh, says, give me a histogram of the temperature variable in the Rapid City data set and change the title to be this thing that we've put in quotation marks here. And here we are, having zoomed in on it. Okay. Uh, the other thing you might want to do, or one of the many things you might want to do here, is not just change the, uh, the main title here, but also change the label that appears on the x-axis. And we do that just by chaining together these flags. We have main here. Uh, the flag for the label of the x-axis is xlab, and we'll make that temperature. You notice we can use either double quotes or single quotes. It doesn't matter as long as they match. So I'll, I'll take that whole block of, of script there and source it. And you notice now we've got a, a graph over here with the temperature uh, labeled here on the x-axis. All right, uh, obvious thing we want to do is make comparisons here. Good statistical graphics facilitate those comparisons. So let's make comparisons of the histogram for San Diego and the histogram for Rapid City. The way we make a multi-frame plot in R is with this little block of code right here. This says change the graphical parameter, give me a multi-frame plot, MF, and then have two rows and one column. Uh, and you could change that to have arbitrary numbers of rows and columns if you wished. Here we just want two rows and one column. So if I just grab that whole block of script and source it, you're gonna see now we get two histograms stacked on top of each other, two rows, one column. I'll zoom and now we can compare the two uh, one on top of the other. Now, in order to make this a fair comparison, we're gonna to need to start changing things like the y-axis to make them comparable and the x-axis to make them comparable, as well as the breaks, because uh, you know, R is treating these as two independent plots and uh, calculating a different set of breaks for each one. Okay, so let's go change that. First things first, let's change the x limits. In other words, you know what the leftmost uh, value here is and what the right, rightmost value here is. We'll do that with the xlim command, which sort of sounds like the xlab, except instead of the label, it's the limits. And this says we want the plot to run from minus 20 to 100 for both plots, and again, stack them on top of each other in a multi-frame plot. So I'll grab that, hit enter, and you notice now at least we've got a comparable a set of x-axes across these two plots. Here's San Diego, here's Rapid City. Still not great because we've got different bin sizes here and here and different heights on the y-axis here and here. So let's go fix those uh, just one at a time. First things first, let's do the bin sizes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the bins go from minus 20, <coughs> excuse me, to 92. Uh, and I'll make them increase in, in increments of two degrees. And I'm gonna save the results in this variable called dancing. You can call it whatever you want. I just called it dancing. There it is. All right, so now we can feed this variable right here as a argument to the, the breaks flag right here. So if I just source this whole block of code, what I'm gonna get is histograms stacked on top of each other of San Diego and Rapid City, both with the same X limits and both with the same set of breaks or bin sizes defined by this variable right here. So let me zoom in on that so you can see it a bit better. And uh, sure enough, now each uh, bin is exactly two degrees wide and that's now comparable. The only thing we've left to fix now is making the y-axis comparable. Let's close that. And now let's change the y limits here. So you might imagine that uh, because we had x limb, we'll also have y limb, and that's exactly what we've got. Uh, let me actually move this so it's a little more readable over here. Uh, so we've got now just concatenating commands here. We've got uh, the, the now I called it my breaks. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, a multi-frame plot with those breaks, those x limits, and those y limits, 0 to 760 for both plots. Source that whole block of code. And now we've got a set of comparable histograms right here. Same x limits, same y limits, same bin sizes. And you can clearly visualize that 
uh, Rapid City, in addition to having a lower average temperature, uh, which is a certainly well-known fact about Rapid City versus San Diego, it also has a much greater variability than San Diego in temperature. Uh, and that, of course, is the point of, the, of this visualization <coughs> that we were after here. Now, down below here, I've got a whole lot of other commands that make the plots pretty. Uh, and this, you can geek out as much as you want with our plots. Uh, I, I don't expect you to do that in this class, as long as you have basic graphs that do uh, things like, you know, have be truthful comparisons about magnitude, that's okay. Uh, but for those of you that are interested in geeking out about R, uh, you know, here's a whole bunch of commands down here that you could just, uh, by inspection, kind of figure out what they do uh, by, by trying and uh, seeing what happens. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let's move on. Uh, let's move to the mammalsleep.r script. Uh, so thus far, we've seen uh, two kinds of data, right? We've seen categorical data and quantitative data, categorical data in the titanic.r script, quantitative data for the temperature uh, variables in the San Diego and, and Rapid City data sets here. And now we'll look at a data set that combines the two of them. That's in mammalsleep.r. Okay. So there are two libraries here that you'll need. One, Mosaic. That'll be our friendly workhorse for the entire semester. The other is called Faraway, uh, which is actually a person's name. Uh, remember the, the basic uh, routine for installing a package. You almost certainly won't have this on your computer. Go to Packages, click on Install Packages, and search for the package called Faraway. There it is. We'll install it. And uh, you should see some action down here. And there it is. Now it's installed. Once it's installed, now we have to load the library. Uh, we'll have to do that every time we do an analysis using that package. So there it is. All right, and now once you've loaded that library, you should have access to the data set called Mammal Sleep, which sits inside that package. The way we load it is not using the import data set command. We just tell our, look, we want to access the Mammal Sleep data set inside this package, and we do this command. Once you've done that, now the Mammal Sleep data set should be at your disposal. Okay, and uh, every row here is a mammal, uh, and then we've got all sorts of information about their sleeping patterns and body sizes and all of that. Uh, you can compute some summary statistics here with the summary command, feeding the mammal sleep data set to the summary function. There we have it. Uh, and this is giving us all sorts of information, uh, right? Uh, you know, median, minimum, first quartile, mean, etc. for the quantitative predictors. Uh, and R thinks everything is a quantitative predictor here. Okay, uh, one of the variables in the data set is this variable dream. Uh, and that is a, uh, a simply a number of hours that that particular animal dreams per night. Uh, they did put these animals in an fMRI machine and, and measure their dreaming, believe it or not. So we'll do a histogram. Notice last time we were using hist. This time we're using histogram. Uh, that's a different alternative histogram function defined in the Mosaic library. Uh, what you may find is that you like uh, just sort of the aesthetics of this one a little bit better. Uh, you know, both one histogram is as good as another. Uh, this one just may be slightly prettier. Uh, the only difference you'll notice is the previous one was a frequency histogram. This is a density histogram. Uh, in other words, it's just making it so that the sum of the areas under all of these uh, blocks is exactly one. All right, uh, now we could change the breaks just like we did before. Uh, you notice before we, we fed an explicit set of breaks to the breaks command. Here we can just, if we wish, just feed it an integer, in this case 20, that says R, give me approximately 20 breaks in the histogram. And there you go. You don't get exactly 20. That's always an approximation. All right. Uh, let's focus now on the danger index. Uh, the danger index is a number 1 to 5. It's on an ordinal scale. Uh, basically, ecologists have sorted these animals into one of five categories, uh, one being the uh, those least in danger of predation when the animal is sleeping, and five being those animals most in danger of predation when they're sleeping. So let's ask for a summary of that variable. All right, and uh, we notice something here. Uh, danger is a categorical predictor as we understand it. It's bucket one, bucket two, bucket three, bucket four, or bucket five. Uh, unfortunately, those are labeled as one, two, three, four, five in the data set. Uh, and therefore, because it's a number, R thinks that you're dealing with a quantitative predictor here. Uh, and th the clue that you know R thinks that is that it's giving you summaries here that are appropriate for quantitative predictors. Minimum, first quartile, median, mean, max, etc. So we need to fix that. Uh, in other words, we need to tell R that danger is not a quantitative predictor. It's actually a categorical predictor. And we do that with this command right here. Uh, what, what, this is, uh, what this is saying is take mammal sleep danger, the danger variable in the mammal sleep data set, turn it into a factor or a categorical predictor, and now overwrite that in mammal sleep dollar danger. Okay, so 
This is just telling R, hey, quant it's a categorical predictor, not a quantitative one. We do that. Uh, it didn't look like anything happened down here. But now if we do the same function we did above, summary, what you're going to see is that we get a table of counts here rather than a, a set of summary statistics. In other words, 19 animals in category 1, 14 animals in category 2. Uh, this is a very common occurrence. A lot of people label categories with numbers, category 1, 2, 3, etc. Uh, and you know, there's no, there's no way a piece of software could know uh, that that's actually a category rather than a number. So you will often have to tell R that things are factors uh, when they are in reality. All right, uh, let's look at a box plot. We do that with the BW plot or box and whisker plot command. Uh, in this case, we're going to look at the number of hours per night that an animal dreams, and we're going to stratify that, that's uh, the twiddle sign, by this danger index that we just, uh, that we just talked about there. So uh, highlight that, hit command enter, and we get a box plot. Okay. Uh, we could also try a dot plot. And here's a dot plot. So instead of boxes and whiskers and all of that, you get the individual data points in each of the, uh, each of the five buckets, bucket one, two, three, four, five, et cetera here. All right, now, uh, one of the most basic statistical models you could possibly fit is to take each group and compute the group mean. And we do that with the mean command. So this says compute the means for the dream variable stratified by the danger factor for the mammal sleep data set. Uh, you're getting a sense that kind of all of these commands have a pretty similar structure to one another. Highlight that, hit command enter. Uh-oh. Okay, so what you're getting down here is telling you that NA is the, is the mean for each of these five groups. Uh, what that means is that the data set has some missing values in it, and those NAs mess up. Uh, the missing values mess up the, co the computation of the mean. This is very frequent uh, in real data, that you have missing data and you need to somehow deal with it. So we can pass a, a, a flag to the mean command saying na.rm, which stands for remove NAs, equals true. That means, uh, that, that means you're telling R to, to ignore the missing values in the computation of these means. So if we do that, we hit command enter on that command right there. Now we get the group wise means. And let's just do a sanity check here, right? So this is saying the mean for group one is 3.13. 3.13 is about right there. That looks right. That's kind of about the mean of those numbers right there. Uh, let's try group four, 1.17. That's about 1.2. Here's group four, 1.2 looks to be about right there. Yeah, that looks plausible of the mean of those numbers right there. Okay. Uh, we could also compute the groupwise standard deviations with the SD command, uh, again using the na.rm equals true flag so that R knows to ignore the missing data. And there are the groupwise standard deviations. You notice there's more spread here in group 1, standard deviation of 1.8, than there is in group 5, standard deviation of 0.25. We're now going to look at a second way of summarizing the same information, uh, and that's using the LM command. You're going to use LM a lot in this course. LM stands for linear model. Uh, so this says fit a linear model for the dream variable uh, using the danger predictor in the mammal sleep data. So you notice this thing right here looks virtually exactly like this command up here. The only difference is instead of mean, we've got LM, linear model. Okay, so let's take a look at this and see how this actually gives you the same information as computing the groupwise means, just in a slightly different format. Well, source this line right here so that it executes in the console down here. And now what we need to do is extract the coefficients of this linear model. In other words, what are the, what are the values, the group means associated with each of these groups? So we do that with the coef function. So I ask for the coefficients of LM1, and there they are. Now, this is going to look very confusing, right? Because we've got intercept, danger 2, danger 3. And you notice, for example, that this number here for danger 2, in other words, the, those in this bucket right here, is minus 1.1-ish. Uh, and that doesn't at all correspond to the group mean, which is uh, you know somewhere here around 2. Uh, so it's, it's sort of difficult to square the output of this with what you're seeing over here in the box plots. The question is, how is this working? Where, what are these numbers representing, and how can we interpret these as providing information about the group means? Let's look at them side by side. Okay, so I'm going to store the group means in this uh, variable called group means, just copying and pasting that command that I had from above here on line 54. Now group means are there. And now I'm going to put group means and the coefficients, right? And, and I'm just giving you, there are actually two ways that you could extract the coefficients, and I'm showing both of them here. 
Uh, one is by asking for the COEF, and one is by saying LM1 dollar coefficients. That says, give me the coefficients associated with this object that I've created up here, LM1. Uh, and this says, our bind says, put them uh, one on top of each other in rows. Okay, so you're gonna look at this. And here are those two, here are the group means, and here are the coefficients from LM1. Uh, now you're gonna notice that this right here and this right here are the same, uh, but obviously this right here and this right here are different. These are the real group means, and the way these numbers here are presenting the information is by asking, what is the difference between this group mean and this group mean? And if you very carefully did this subtraction, right, I'll just copy and paste these here, to say what's the difference between group mean 1 and group mean 2, what do we get? Uh, well, it's 1.119, uh, and sure enough, there we go, 1.119. Uh, so in other words, this second row is telling you that this group mean right here is this amount less than the baseline case. All right, uh, let's try this just one more time as a sanity check. Let's try it for group four. There's the group one mean, and here's the group four mean right there. Just copied and paste those. Uh, the difference between that mean and that mean is like 1.957, etc. cetera. Uh, and sure enough, that's exactly what we've got. So this is giving you two different ways of presenting the same information. Group means says, what are the means? LM, the linear model function, says, what's the baseline? In that case, the baseline here is group one. And then what are the offsets or differences from the other groups to the baseline? Again, mathematically, it's exactly the same set of information, just two different ways of presenting it. Uh, and what I've got here in the rest of the script that I'm not gonna go over here, but that I encourage you to try in your own time, is to just convince you that this whole business of, of them presenting the same pieces of information, the group means and the linear model coefficients, doesn't depend on whether we choose group one as the baseline or any of the other groups as the baseline, that at the end of the day, you get the same statistical model and the same information conveyed by that model. Okay, uh, so that wraps this up. Uh, we've, we've hit a lot uh, in this particular video. Uh, we've done categorical data, quantitative data, uh, and some basic tools like box plots, dot plots, uh, and group-wise uh, linear models uh, for when we have a mixture of the two. Uh, next up uh, in, in a future video is when we have uh, an interest in modeling a relationship between two or more quantitative predictors, and that's when we start fitting straight lines to data.